All right, guys, I just got done night diving in Indonesia, and I cannot believe what we just filmed tonight with the bobbit worm is mind-blowing. Total nightmare fuel, but super awesome at the same time. Check this out. You won't be sorry. We're starting our dive at dusk and we'll be focused on the seabed in front of us. This is typically when the most interesting creatures are active. And right away, there's a lionfish. These fish are down here hunting right now and those spines on its back are covered in a potent neurotoxin that can cause excruciating pain and even paralysis in anything it touches. These waters are absolutely filled with them, as well as their cousin, the scorpion fish. So anytime I make contact with the ocean floor, I'll be checking to make sure that I don't land on anything I'm not supposed to. Now I've seen a lot of bizarre and nightmarish looking creatures before. I've been bitten by blood worms, burned by, burned a fireworm, by a fireworm, and even stung by the infamous man -o -worm. Man -o -worm. But nothing makes my skin crawl quite like the bobbit worm. These elusive predators have built up a serious reputation over the years and even inspired monsters in movies like the ones in Dune and Tremors, both featuring killer sandworms that live underground that burst through the desert sand with their powerful jaws to attack and kill their prey. Those worms are science fiction. The bobbit worm you are about to see feed in the night is very real. Now at this point in the dive, I had no idea I was going to find any bobbit worms. But these are the events as they unfolded, leading to that very moment. What we have here is a school of catfish. They use a very interesting schooling technique where they actually cascade over each other like a waterfall. They do this to take turns so they can stop and feed, but there's always another catfish to replace the front line. Grouping together like this helps ward off predators and makes the school of catfish appear like a much larger fish. Time to move on. Oh wow, look at that. I have never seen one of these nudibranch before. This one is actually called a bubble shell. It gets its name because of that shell right there at the center of its body. Now these shells are different to the ones on a typical snail. They are thin, fragile, and too small to fit the entire animal inside. but it is absolutely stunning in coloration. Look at those bright blue edges. It almost glows out here in the darkness. Very cool. On night dives like this, you really never know what you're going to find. It's a very alien-like environment, and when you're out here in the muck, it almost appears like the lunar surface. Here is another really bizarre and unique creature. This is a cuttlefish. Related to the octopus, these sea creatures are super intelligent. In fact, some scientists believe they're more intelligent than their eight-armed cousins. Let's carefully swim up for a closer look. What's really unique about these creatures at first sight is how they change their coloration almost instantaneously. Oh, look at this, it's moving into hunt. Oh, it almost got that fish. That fish was so lucky. Oh. The cuttlefish is turning right toward me. <gasps> look at that coloration change. Now, some scientists believe not only did they change their coloration as a camouflage technique, but they can actually communicate through the change in color and pattern in their skin. I wonder if it's trying to tell me something. Clearly it knows that I'm no longer a threat. It's hanging out. Let me just put my hand out right. Guys, this is too cool. This cuttlefish is so comfortable with us that it's letting me almost use my hand as a perch. Now make no mistake, these cuttlefish are super fast and they could swim away in a split second if it wanted to. 
and it's likely just as curious about me as I am about it. Holy cow, I'm almost at a loss for words. All right, let's grab our dive rig and keep adventuring into the night. Wow, that's a pair of moray eels. This is one of the animals that divers need to be especially careful around because they are super territorial and they also have razor sharp teeth. If you stick your hand in the wrong place down here, you can take a pretty aggressive chomp from one of these large eels. And the biggest problem is once they bite, they don't let go. They can even spin into a death roll similar to a crocodile. We're gonna leave those two alone and keep moving forward. Now that is a porcupine fish, and a super colorful one at that. A lot of the porcupine fish that I'm used to seeing are more brown and gray in coloration. This one is more of a reddish maroon. And oh, I found something so cool. Guys, check this out. This is a bobtail squid. I've always wanted to see one of these. Now these bobtail squid really look like a little octopus because of their super long tentacles. They're almost the in-between between a cuttlefish and an octopus, but these bobtail squid are also super intelligent and extremely charismatic. It's trying to bury itself beneath the sand to hide away from our cameras. I see you. Look at it using its little arms to cover itself with sand and sediment to try to blend in. You can still see its little siphon is uncovered there. Wow. Whoa, look out for those. Those are scorpion fish and they are venomous. Related to the stonefish, these scorpion fish have venomous spines on the dorsal and pectoral fins. And if you accidentally brush into them, they can give you a really nasty sting. I know all too well just how it feels because I once took a sting from the scorpion fish And I've tested myself. the sting of a man of war. Ah, man, that one nailed me. What is that? That's a bobbit worm. Oh my gosh. We gotta get in for a closer look. Those mandibles, look at those jaws, they are huge. If that's not a sci-fi monster, I don't know what is. And look at its skin. It's iridescent. It almost has a rainbow shimmer to it. And you can see its serrated jaws open and ready to clasp onto any would-be victim that crosses its path. And do you see those little antenna? right by the jaws, those are sensory organs, sensing the chemicals and vibrations in the water so it can detect prey and launch out for an attack. 
And with a body length of up to 10 feet, there's a lot more to this worm than meets the eye. And using all that friction that it has from that long burrow, it possesses incredible strength and can take down large fish as prey in a split second. Let's see if we can get the bobbin worm to snap its jaws for the cameras. Whoa! <laughs> oh my goodness. Wow. Now not only are those jaws serrated, but the bristles along its body are actually venomous. And the bobbit worm uses them as a defense mechanism. So it's not just the jaws you have to worry about. Oh no! The little porcupine fish followed us over. It must be attracted to the dive lights. That porcupine fish is very lucky to have escaped the bobbin worm. But that was pretty interesting to see it use its defense mechanism to puff up like that and to be successful with it. Whew, that got my heart racing. Let's wait here for a second to see if this bobbin worm can find any other prey. Look who showed up. The scorpion fish is coming to take a look. I wonder if the scorpion fish thinks this bobbit worm could be food. It certainly is creeping in really slow. Let's hang here for a second to see what happens. I cannot believe what we just saw. I think we're gonna to need to see that one more time, but this time we're gonna slow it down. You can really see how the bobbit worm inspired the movies Dune and Tremors. Look at the sand bubbling. I can only imagine 
what's happening down there below the surface. That might be the most disturbing thing I have ever seen on any dive I've ever been on. Wow. Scientists are still uncovering the mysteries of this notorious creature. Not only seeking to understand its behavior, but also its role in the environment. But one thing is for certain, these creatures are absolutely terrifying. The Portuguese man of war will actually wash up on the beaches here in Florida, sometimes by the hundreds. Actually, I think I see one right up there. Oh, all right, here we go. Those are two pretty good looking man of war right there. Woo, careful guys, don't wanna get hit by, woo, that is dangerous. If I get whipped by that, we're gonna get stung way, whoa, way sooner than I want to. So everyone knows this is the end for them. When they wash up on the beach here, they will unfortunately dry out and that's kind of it, circle of life. So the fact that we're taking these two today for our experiment is totally a good use for their end of life. And boy, do they look beautiful. But sometimes with beauty comes pain. And this is a super painful jar. All right, let's head up out of the wind and take a closer look. I remember these tables, except all of the shoots before this one, I was on the other side of the camera. So yeah, this is uh, a little bit different than I'm used to. In this bucket, we have a variety of different sting remedies. Some of them good, some of them not so good. And that's the reason why I wanted to make this video in the first place. Let's talk about the organism, the creature, the Portuguese. Are we gonna do that every time? The Portuguese man -o war Although it looks like one, the Portuguese man -o war is not actually a jellyfish. It is a siphonophore. Unlike a jellyfish, which can survive on their own, siphonophores are a group of colonized organisms made up of clone cells. Each group are responsible for specific tasks to keep the man -o war alive. Some cells form the float, which suspend the organism on the water's surface and create a sail to move with the wind. Others are responsible for hunting prey, and this is where we meet, the venom-filled nematocyst. These small but potent cells cover the man -o war's stinging tentacles by the thousands, and within each is a spiral-shaped barb which literally blasts out when making contact with its victim. When these barbs penetrate the skin, they release a cocktail of enzymes very similar to snake venom. These enzymes are designed to incapacitate prey, and in my case, will cause instantaneous pain. This animal is notorious for its sting. In fact, it stings thousands of people here in the state of Florida every single year. I luckily have never taken a sting until now. Time for me to take two stings from the Portuguese man -o war in order to compare the effectiveness of the most famous remedies for being stung by a man -o war today I'll be taking two stings, side by side, on the same arm. One of them to be treated with urine, the controversial yet universally accepted cure to all marine creature stings, and on the other, I will spray white vinegar, the suggested first aid from a University of Hawaii research article. Then, while enduring the venom from both stings, I will attempt to describe which of these two remedies relieves my pain the best. Two sting sites, two different antidotes, which one works the best, you're about to find out. Please do not attempt to do what I'm doing here today. Um, oh gosh, I'm so nervous I can't even get a hold of it. Okay guys, I think I got it, you ready? Okay, here we go. About to take, oh God, that looks horrible. Whew, man, I'm getting nervous. Here we go. About to take two stings from the Portuguese man of war. You guys get your shots ready because this is only going to happen one time. Terror of the ocean. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! Yep. It's getting me. Oh, yeah. I can feel it. Ah! Ooh. Ooh. That's like electric. Yeah. That's one. Wow. It burns right away. Okay. Second sting. I got to do this fast before that gets too bad. Ready, guys? Ready? All right. One, two, Second thing, three. Ah, yep. Oh, man, that one nailed me. Oh. Mm. Okay, yep. So, 
instant, uh, almost tingly, electrical feeling sting. A lot different than a bee sting or a wasp. Oh man, those are really getting in there. I could feel it now. Now, likely there are still hundreds of nematocysts that are, oh yeah, they are erupting as I'm talking to you right now. I could feel them individually firing, like pow, 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 like a series of bullets going into my skin. Woo, yeah. Hmm, yeah. You can see it getting red on both sites. Now, stink site one up here at the top, stink site two down here at the bottom. I can actually see remnants from the tentacles and those likely have many nematocysts in them. And it is getting worse and worse with every second. Oh man, this is bad. You do not want to get stung by a Portuguese man of war. If I were a fish right now, I'd be in big trouble. In fact, I would likely already be in complete paralysis and this man of war would be reeling me in for dinner. Okay, let the healing begin as they say. All right, there is two steps to this. One, spray on the agent. Two, use a plastic card because you wanna scrape off as many of those nematocysts that have yet to explode as you can. First sight, vinegar. Here we go. Okay. Oh yeah, smells like vinegar. Now the one I'm dreading, gross. This is so disgusting, this is so nasty. All right, you guys are a little downwind, so you might wanna prepare to duck and cover. All right, here we go. Oh man, I don't wanna splash my face. Oh, 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 it stinks. Oh, okay, that's enough. Scraping off those active nematocysts is certainly part of the equation, so you don't wanna forget that step. I can actually see my skin pulsing. You guys see my skin going up and down there? All the nerves in my arm right now are probably just screaming like, ah, intruder, we have venom. I feel so much better already. It feels like I'm on the road to healing. Man, it still burns though. So now it's just more of the burning. Okay, yeah, I think I'm, I'm ready to make a, a declaration of sorts at this point. Vinegar, not only more sanitary, but definitely wins the contest. This is by far the least of the two when it comes to pain. The urine site, not only is it absolutely disgusting, but it definitely burns a little worse. And I could definitely feel a distinction between the two. So I'm gonna go ahead and call it. Vinegar is the definitive antidote that you want to use if you want to neutralize stinging cells on your skin. Urine, not your best friend when it comes to a jellyfish sting or a man of war sting for that matter. And there is one last step that will truly alleviate the pain symptoms that I'm feeling in my arm. Good old fashioned hot water. The reason hot water is the ultimate antidote to a man of war sting is because the heat from the water will actually denature the proteins in the venom, rendering them inert, completely harmless. And then it's just up to my body and my immune system to do the cleanup work and I'll be as good as new. Oh my gosh, guys, this is, I've never had a hot conference feel so good. Like immediate relief. And I hope everybody watching not only enjoyed this little experiment, but learned something to take home with you. Don't use urine, use vinegar to treat jellyfish stings or man of war stings. And at the end of the day, hot compress is going to be your real solution. While I did experience slight discomfort for the next few hours, the scrape and heat treatment reduced my pain to that of a mild sunburn. And by the next day, nearly all signs of redness had vanished and I was as good as new. So next time you're on the beach and you see a man of war, avoid it. But just in case you don't, some white vinegar and a hot compress seem to do the trick. So yeah, you should leave your pee in the toilet. And if you wanna learn more about what's going on here, we do have the article from the University of Hawaii in the description. There's more science, there's more facts in there we weren't able to cover this afternoon. But I do wish you the good fortune to never encounter a man of war for yourself so you can avoid a sting like this. I cannot believe we are standing right in front of this many deep sea giant isopod. This is something that you will probably not find anywhere else on earth. This is one of the only places in the world to get hands on with the deep sea isopod. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight giant isopod in the tank in front of us to learn all about in today's video. Whoa, this is incredible. I cannot believe we're standing in front of these creatures. There are about 20 variety of them that live in the Atlantic, the Pacific, and the Indian Oceans, very, very deep at the bottom. We're talking anywhere from 700 to 7,000 feet. Wow.
wow, that is deep. And about half of the isopods on planet Earth live in the ocean and half of them live on land. Although these are the largest isopods that you can find, the ones that live in your backyard are those small little pill bugs. The roly poly is related directly to the giant isopod. Now, even though they look like it, these isopods are not insects. They're not bugs. They are actually more closely related to crabs and lobsters. And, oh boy, they are super weird looking, I will admit, but man, are they cool. If you were to come visit this aquarium, anyone is allowed to touch the deep sea isopods. This is a touch tank. In fact, there are ports all around the top here and yep, that water is cold. Definitely kept below 50 degrees at all times, but anyone can come up and pet the giant isopod. But today we are getting extra special permission to remove the top of the aquarium and get really hands-on because I want to get the giant isopod as close to the cameras as possible. Because these animals live in the deepest parts of the ocean, they need to keep their aquarium here as cold as possible. So this water is kept around 50 degrees Fahrenheit at all times to mimic the deepest parts of the ocean. Oh, all right, here goes nothing. Time to get hands-on with the giant isopod. Oh, this is creepy. Here we go. Whoa. Oh, man. Wow. Look at that. Alien. That is unbelievable. Look at that face. A face only a mother could love. I think you're cool, though. All right. Why is the giant isopod so giant? I mean, its cousin, the roly-poly, is probably a one thousandth of its size. Well, the most well-accepted theory is deep-sea gigantism, which is found in a variety of animals, most notably in the squid species. Of course, you've probably heard of the giant squid or the colossal squid that are huge. Same goes with the giant isopod, much, much larger than any of its terrestrial or shallower relatives. Now, there are around 20 species of large isopods that live in the deep sea, but this one is the biggest. And there are two size ranges. There's giants and super giants. A giant isopod will be anywhere from three to six inches, and a super giant, like this one, can be up to two feet in length. And I would say the one in front of us here is approaching maximum size. Look at that creature. <laughs> this is too cool. Now the exoskeleton is really rigid, a lot like a lobster or a crab. I can really feel the rigidity of those segments. The underside is very soft. I can actually press in on the belly of the beast. That is wild. I did not expect a giant isopod to have softer parts like that. And on the underside here, we have the pleopods, which can also be found on animals like lobsters. And these are the swimming appendages of this animal. Yes, believe it or not, although this looks like an insect that can only crawl around, the giant isopod is an excellent swimmer. And what's also really cool about the pleopods is these are the appendages that allow the animal to breathe. There's actually a gas exchange that occurs in those parts of the animal. The legs feel super creepy, but not that menacing. Now, we'll move up from the legs and we want to take a closer look at that head. So you'll notice the giant isopod has pretty big eyes. In fact, their eyes are specially developed for very dark environments. When you get below a thousand feet in the ocean, you enter what's called the midnight zone where almost no light can travel. So for their entire lives, these animals live in almost complete darkness they have pretty poor eyesight. They're not very responsive to light changes at all, and they rely most of their lives on navigating around and understanding their environment through these four antenna appendages here. There's two sets of antenna. The small ones at the top are chemical sensing. So this is what's going to help them find their food. It's going to help them understand what other animals or organic things are around them in the environment. And then you have the feelers, the two longer antenna underneath. And these two antenna are used to feel their way around their environment, which is completely dark. I'm, I'm having a, a fairly hard time hanging onto it. It's definitely trying to get back down to the bottom of the tank. Its legs are equipped with these grappling hooks. It's almost like a claw, like a lobster claw. In fact, yeah, look at that. It's got my finger in its front claws there and they can actually squeeze down and can grapple on. And what they use those claws for are breaking apart their prey and forcing the food to the mouth. Yes, it looks strange 
and I can tell you its diet is even stranger. These are carnivorous creatures of the deep sea, and they will eat just about anything that they can get their mouths on. I'm talking deceased fish, I'm talking whales. Researchers have even fed alligators to these animals to see if they would eat something that's not native to their environment. And yes, they absolutely will. And because of their appetite for all things deceased, you're probably asking yourself, what would happen if a human ended up down there at the bottom of the sea? Yes, as morbid as it sounds, if a human ends up in their environment, it's on the menu too. Now I wanna find something out. You know, obviously I've been keeping my fingers and hands away from those mouth parts all video long, but now it's time to find out, does the isopod have a taste for human flesh? Should we find out? Let's give it a quick try. You guys ready for this? That water is cold and I know those mouth parts, those four sets of jaws, are extraordinarily sharp. Ooh, this is creepy. So I'm gonna put the mouth right on my arm and see what happens. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, you see it? Ah, I can feel it poking around. It's trying to figure out what's going on. Oh, it's, oh, it's claws are digging in. Ah, that water. So cool. <sighs> Nothing. Just wants to hang out. And I wanted to show you that for a reason because although these creatures can look menacing, they are absolutely gentle giants and they would never bite a human being in this circumstance. There's no need to fear this animal. If you ever come out to this aquarium, I highly recommend that you check out the giant isopod touch tank because getting hands on or even having the chance to touch an animal from the abyss like this is truly a once in a lifetime opportunity. All right, well, my hands are freezing. I'm gonna put our isopod friend here back at the bottom of the tank. I hope everybody at home enjoyed this look at our first ever deep sea creature. Right now, we are searching these tide pools off the coast of Eastern Australia for the most toxic fish on the planet. The stonefish is notorious for having the most painful sting in all of nature. And today, I'm going to get stung by a stonefish. But first, we've got to find one. Let's get looking. It's going to be very hard to find the stonefish because in addition to their legendary sting, they are masters of hiding. The key to this is going to be to move slow, methodically, to not step on the stonefish. You could be looking right at a stonefish and not even realize it. And that's why so many people step on them by accident. But stonefish aren't all we have to look out for. This isn't the only animal that could do you harm here in the Typhoons off of Australia. We also have cone snails and the blue ring octopus, one of the most lethal creatures in the world. And not only is it risky just being out here, but we also have to beat the clock. The tide is coming in fast, and this whole area is about to be completely underwater. So if we want to catch a stonefish, we need to do that before it happens. Everything looks exactly the same. This is gonna to be tough. Oh, right there. You see it moving? That is the stonefish. And I never would have seen that fish if it didn't give itself away by moving. Holy smokes. Now these fish are so toxic, they don't really have a flight response. I'm gonna attempt to catch the most toxic fish in the world with my bare hands. All right, here we go. Wow, there it is. That is the stonefish. Look at that tide pool monster. I can't believe we found one. I mean, it looks like a living rock. I never would have spotted this fish if it didn't move. The fact that it swam a little bit there is the only reason I was able to catch this fish. And you can see how docile this fish is. It knows just how toxic it can be. Wow. But the table is set for what will be likely the worst sting I ever take. Placing the stonefish in the tank hit my nerves hard. I'm about to get stung by a stonefish. 
Stonefish stings are said to be one of the most painful experiences a human can endure. And I've already experienced my fair share of fish stings. One from the most common fish sting, which is the lionfish. Ah! Oh! And the other from the scorpion fish, which is the most toxic fish sting in North America. Oh! Yeah, he got me. Oh! Each sting was painful, but I was certainly able to tough it out with basic treatment. However, each of those fish fall far short of the danger from the stonefish. Not every day you get to carry around the world's most toxic fish in a tank. This fish might just have the worst sting in the entire animal kingdom. Man, my nerves are firing right now. Just looking at this fish is so incredibly cool. Look at all the growths all over its body. Definitely earns its name, the stonefish, a master of camouflage. All right, let's go hands-on once again with the stonefish. The reason I can handle this fish is because it can only sting from the spines on top. Wow. This fish has developed the most potent fish toxin in the world. The toxin is only to defend itself. Unfortunately, as you can see, it is so docile that it's very easy for people to step on these fish. And that is the most common way people are stung by the stonefish. The toxin of this fish not only induces extraordinary pain, it can actually cause muscle spasms and eventual paralysis. And there have even been reported deaths from stonefish stings. But now I think it's time to see how this fish injects its venom. I'm going to just pour out this water. I'm gonna use this little tank here as a platform. This fish is perfectly fine being out of the water for extended periods of time because they've adapted the ability to actually hold water in their gills. It's not uncommon to see stonefish just laying on the rocks in these tide pools. So in the little bit of time that we have it here in front of the cameras, totally fine. All right, so I brought with me a piece of neoprene. I'm going to use this piece of neoprene to simulate skin so I can show you what would happen if you stepped on the stonefish. This animal has the ability to fire its venom into the wound created by its spine. That's why people who are envenomated and step on these stonefish end up in such a bad situation. It's not only that it's the most toxic venom, it's that you also get the most volume. Look at how sharp that spine is. Okay, in order to do this properly, I do need to get out some eye protection, so I'm gonna do that quickly. This venom, it has enough toxin in it to cause vision problems and perhaps even blindness. All right, let's see in slow motion how these spines inject venom. I'm gonna do these top two, you guys ready? Here they go. One, two, three. Oh, wow. Look at that. And it's like blue. Holy cow, look at how much venom just came out of that fish. And let's do another one, do it one more time. Oh my gosh, guys, the spines are blue. And once those spines are out, they stay out and they're ready to defend. All right, let me try these uh, spines on the back here. One, two, three. Wow, that is what would be inside of your foot if you were to step on a stonefish. Now, it will regenerate its venom. This doesn't hurt the fish at all. And you can see these sheaths will just slide right back up. But holy cow, I gotta take a minute and process what I just saw. Oh, that is bad. I won't lie, I'm getting pretty nervous right now. This is something you should never do. I've consulted experts, people who have been stung. I've done my research, I've done my homework, but even still, I am extremely nervous about what is about to happen. It said that this is the most painful sting in the world. Wish me luck. The moment has come. It's time to be stung by the world's most toxic fish. I am borderline terrified. I've thought long and hard about whether or not to even go through with this, but I'm doing this today because through my research on the stonefish, I have found a lot of misinformation out there. There is a lot of stories that pretty much describes certain death if you're stung by a stonefish, and that's just simply not the case. While this toxin in the base of its spines is extremely potent, it is thermal liable. So if treated properly, and if needed with medical attention, you will survive the sting of a stonefish. Most 
of the victims that end up dying from stonefish stings, but has more to do with the pain and shock that leads to cardiac arrest. This venom is meant to cause you pain, but I have brought the antidote with me today. A thermos filled with hot water that's around 114 degrees Fahrenheit, a compress to hold over the wound, and then of course, if I do go into any state of anaphylactic shock, I always carry with me an EpiPen. We are about three minutes drive from an emergency room. So even if the worst case scenario does unfold today, I should have plenty of time to be able to get to emergency medical attention. All right, my plan today is to take a micro dose of stonefish venom. The venom from that neoprene trial is already coating the spikes. So they are locked and loaded, ready to go. When it's all said and done, this should be just extraordinarily painful for me and hopefully very educational for you. This is going to likely be the worst sting that I ever take. I'm Mark Vins, and I'm about to enter the sting zone with the stonefish, the most toxic fish in the world. All right, I'm gonna go with this front spine here. Ready? This spine. On three. One. Two. Three. Ah! Mmm. Yep. Mmm. I already feel burned. I could feel it spreading up my finger right now. And it does not feel good. Wow, the tide is coming in. All right, here, let's, mm, hang on. Mm, let's move out of here, the tide's rolling. You okay, Mark? Yeah, hang on, I'm gonna come over here. Andrew, put the fish back in the tank, man. Mm. Oh, right there is where, where the spine went in. God, immediate fire spreading up my fingers. I can already feel it in these, these three. Mmm. Can you help Mark or are you okay? No, I'm okay, I'm okay right now. It's like a different magnitude of pain. It is like throbby, achy. Mm. Hang on, I gotta walk it off. Yeah. I'm gonna try to tough it out for a little bit. I wanna see how far the venom spreads before I start applying the first aid. This is borderline unbearable. Mm. Oh my gosh. Mm. Let me know when you need the watermark. I'm just like, it's making me nervous. Mm. Oh my gosh. Yeah, definitely drew a little bit of blood. Oh, and it is hot. It's like closing my hand is becoming hard. Mm. Yeah, it's spreading. It's like all up the back of my hand now. Mm. Mm. I think I need to go for the hot water, guys. I don't want this to spread anymore. I'm going to the hot water. Mm. There we go. Stonefish is good. Now I need to fix myself. So this hot water will actually stop the venom from working and should help my pain. Mm. Every bit as painful as advertised. I never want to do that again. And I need to get more hot water on this sting. And hopefully the pain subsides, but it's still increasing for me. Tingling pain continued to build and spread up through my shoulder all the way to my neck. Even a month after the sting, I still have numbness and tingles in my fingers. The immediate pain wasn't enough to send me to the hospital, but as we released the stonefish, I could imagine what would happen if a full load of its venom were to go in my foot. That instance would send you directly to the hospital. And if you're ever stung, please, you should seek medical attention as soon as possible. Needless to say, the stonefish certainly lives up to the legend of being the most painful fish on the planet. Oh, wants to bite me. I'm actually going to get chomped. Ready? One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah he's biting me. Oh, he's got me good. Mm, ah, he's, he's, he's latched, he's latched. Ah. Ah, ah, he won't let go. Oh, he won't let go. Oh, got one. Oh, yeah. Woo, yeah. This, believe it or not, is one of the most famous 
creatures ever featured on the Brave Wilderness channel. That's right, the original Bloodworm video now has over 73 million views. But in that original adventure, we did leave a few things on the table that are definitely worth revisiting. Namely, the venomous bite of this creature. Actually, did Coyote take a bite? Ow! Oh. Yay! Did it bite you? He got me! <laughs> I got that! He got me, I felt it, it was a little pinch. Let me see, where'd he get you? Right there, right in the crux of my finger. I think we can do better than just a pinch for one of the world's only venomous worms. In fact, we learned something very important about this creature between the last adventure and today that's going to help us achieve a bite on camera. But before I go getting myself chomped for this new bloodworm experiment, we need to find a whole lot more worms than just this one. Let's keep digging. Bloodworms hunt for prey in the tidal mudflats of both the Atlantic and Pacific coasts of the United States and Canada. They have also earned the nickname sludge worm, since their habitat consists of thick mud and quicksand that can easily swallow your boots whole. To find these slimy predators, worm diggers use special rakes to quickly peel back mud and reveal worms on the move that could be sold as prize fishing bait. And while they can be difficult to find, some of the best worm diggers in Maine can collect up to 1,000 worms a day, with the largest ones growing up to 15 inches long. After hours of digging and covered head to toe in mud and sweat, we fill the bucket and set the stage for one of the worst bites we've ever filmed. Welcome to the bloodworm bite table. What I have in front of me here are five very large bloodworms. No, these are not your granddad's night crawlers, folks. These are natural born killers. Armed with four venomous fangs and an appetite to match, we have been told that these worms pack one heck of a bite. Some people say that it's like a bee sting, and locals have even told us that they've seen worm diggers crawling out of the mud flats in near tears from being bitten by these carnivorous worms. But there is one key piece of information that we learned from the original bloodworm video to today, and that is you can actually head a bloodworm. Similar to how a herpetologist would head a venomous snake to keep it from biting them, I will actually attempt to grab the proboscis once it shoots out and then intentionally inflict my first bite. And yes, I said first bite. There's gonna be more than one. Now what I'm going to try to do is head the proboscis and while I'm attempting to do this, let's review some of the most interesting facts about this bizarre marine oddity. The bloodworm is a venomous segmented worm that hunts invertebrates and other marine creatures. Armed with four razor sharp fangs, and a projectile mouth called a proboscis, they are voracious predators and are as aggressive as they are bizarre. One of the most shocking things about these worms is how normal they can appear and then in a split second, transform into one of the most alien looking life forms you've ever seen. And as if this wasn't creepy enough, things get even worse. Once the blood worm has its prey ensnared in those hooked jaws, it will inject it with a paralyzing venom that incapacitates the victim so it can be digested and eaten a lot. This venom is chemically similar to that of a scorpion and is known to cause severe reactions in humans, including burning, tissue damage, and anaphylactic shock. Please do not attempt what you're about to see. Oh, almost got it. Ah, I missed it. Oh, 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 come on. All right. I got it. Oh, wants to bite me. That is the proboscis of one of the biggest blood worms I have ever seen. Holy moly. That's over a foot for sure. Okay, time to get bitten by one of the only venomous worms on the planet, the blood worm. Got a good hold on it. Here we go. One, two, three. Ah! Oh, look at that. Ah, uh, he won't let go. Ah, uh, he won't let go. Oh. Ah. Oh, he's in. Go, oh, he's really on there, guys. I can't get him off. Ah, uh, he's biting me. Oh, he's got me good. Yeah, he got me. Ah, oh, man, didn't break the skin. It was definitely latched into me, but its fangs I don't think are long enough to break the skin of my finger. I wonder if I try on a softer part. Let's try my wrist. 
It's a little bit thinner there, uh, a little bit softer. All right, here we go. Let's go in for the second bite on three. One, two, three. Oh yeah, oh yep, see him tug on the skin. Ah, oh, he's, he's, he's latched, he's latched. Ah, oh, yeah, mm. oh, I can't get him off. Mm. Mm. Yeah, he's got me, you see that? Ah, oh, keep rolling, keep rolling. I'm gonna try to pry him off. Mm, he's really latched on. Mm. Come on, let go, let go. Ah, oh, he won't let go, oh, he won't let go. Gotta get him off, ah. Oh. Oh yeah, that was a full on blood worm bite. Boy, that burns. Gosh, you get that shot? Got Those it. fangs were all the way latched in. Oh. Oh, oh that burns. Ooh, man, yes. You can see that there wasn't much blood produced from the bite, but I've got blisters forming and that's likely due to all the inflammation and swelling. I feel it in the nervous system. My wrist is screaming right now. Super painful burning sensation. A lot like a wasp or a bee sting. It's those fangs are like little talons and it just grabbed right through the skin and did not want to let go. They were like barbs on a fishing hook. They were just in there. And really, I wasn't able to get the worm off until it decided to relax a little bit and I pried it back. But those fangs are definitely sharp enough. Yikes, that hurt. Now that we've witnessed what a single blood worm is capable of, let's see what happens when I submerge my hands in over a hundred of them. Do blood worms hunt in packs? We're about to find out. Before I attempt to feed my hands to these four fang terrors, let's take a look at what they did to some normal prey from the wild. While related and very similar looking to blood worms, the sandworm is not nearly as formidable. And after a short time in a small aquarium, we can see they are also very much their food. The venomous bloodworms attacked and broke down the sandworms quickly. And what you're seeing now are signs of both chewing and dismemberment, a clear sign of active predation. If you thought one bloodworm bite was bad, check this out. Whoa, look at all these worms. That is a container filled with over 100 blood worms in this tank. And I'm going to attempt to submerge my hands into this tank of blood worms for two minutes. All in an effort to figure out, do blood worms hunt in packs? Ready? On three. One, two, three. Oh, oh, that feels so weird. Ah, I just took my first bite. Hit, me on, the, hit me on the pinky. Mmm, oh. it was a bite and release. Oh, I could feel them. Uh, yeah, I could feel more proboscis going. It's like you could feel them tense up and then poof, it fires out. Ah, ah, the anticipation is killing me. If you could see them wriggling, they, they have their little sensory tips sensing their environment for anything that they can eat or get those jaws on. Oh, I could see a lot of them are shooting their proboscis out already. They sense something foreign in their environment. I gotta look away. This is like too much anxiety just looking at this container. This has gotta be the creepiest thing I have ever done in my entire life. Just so disgusting, feeling all those worms wriggling around my fingers. One thing that we noticed earlier is that as soon as one of them fires their proboscis, it seems to create a rapid fire effect. They all do it at the same time. They're going crazy. They are. I feel them wriggling around my fingers. Oh man, oh yeah. Ah, got another one. Mm. Oh my goodness, so creepy. All right, how much time left? 30 seconds left. All right, this has gotta be the longest two minutes of my life. Two minutes feels like an eternity. Ah, oh, 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 the blood worm bite tank. Oh, this is horrible. Give me a countdown. Five. Ah, four, got me again. Three. That's three. Two. One. Ah. Oh. <sighs> Definitely got nailed on the pinky on this side. And I got two nips between my fingers here and here. 
definitely got nipped three times. Wow, that was weird. What a crazy day on the Brave Wilderness Channel. Well, I don't know if we can definitively say that bloodworms like to hunt in packs, but I'll tell you this, they sure don't mind sharing a meal, but man, that original bite, that was a serious, serious chomp from a bloodworm. It is absolutely swollen and very tender to the touch. I have a feeling I'm gonna be in pain for quite a while on that one. And I was absolutely correct. The bite of a bloodworm was no joke and ended up becoming one of the most painful experiences I've endured so far. Overnight, the swelling increased dramatically and the burning around the bite spread through my hand and up my arm, nearly locking my wrist. Then, days after the initial pain subsided, I had a secondary reaction where the bite zone flared up with an aggressive rash and itched at least twice as much as poison ivy. In all, it took three weeks to heal from the bloodworm venom. And I'm here to officially say the scary rumors of bloodworms are 100% true. So while these creatures are an important part of the intertidal ecosystem and a valued resource for fishing towns across Maine, you absolutely want to avoid their bite at all costs. Ouch! Exclamation point. Welcome to Guadalupe a remote volcanic island 175 nautical miles off the coast of Mexico's Baja Peninsula. This towering mountainous expanse of prehistoric Earth will serve as a backdrop to my greatest adventure to date. We made it. Because if there's one place on Earth to find the world's largest predatory shark, this is it. What's cool about Guadalupe is it's kind of like the sister to the Farallon Islands that we filmed at before. Unfortunately, we didn't see any sharks in the Farallons, but down here, the sharks come in because of the seals. They have three different species of pinniped here in Guadalupe. They've got their endemic fur seal population, they've got California sea lions, and then of course they have northern elephant seals, all of which are on the menu for the great white shark. And the place we are at right now is known as the kill zone. This is the space between the feeding grounds where the seals need to hunt their food and the shore where they rest during the day. And as you can imagine, in that space in between is the great white shark's favorite buffet. But our goal isn't to see seals getting eaten while we're out here. Our goal is to get under the water in the realm of the great white shark so we can get the cameras up close and personal with one of the world's top marine predators. Our home in this mystical place will be none other than the Socorro Vortex of the Pelagic Fleet. This ship and its crew have been making the voyage to Guadalupe for years and have been assisting in shark research and conservation all along the way. The very first step to try to protect sharks it's to get in the water with them. Once you're in the water with them, it's a completely different perspective you will get forever. So one of the biggest differences between what we tried to do in the Farallon Islands and what we're doing out here in Guadalupe is this. We actually get to use a tractant, AKA bait, to draw on the sharks close to the cages and therefore up close to the cameras. All right guys, I think it's time to get suited up because it's about to be our turn to get in the water. As I began to suit up, reality sunk in. I do need to say, this is the point where the nerves start to kick in. And it's not because I'm scared, it's not out of fear, it's healthy because an activity like this is not risk-free. Even though we're with one of the best crews in the world when it comes to diving in cages with great white sharks, we still have to have our wits about us. Anything can happen. We're talking a ton plus animal that can be ferocious in a moment's notice. And they can literally rip these cages apart. In fact, one of my friends caught footage of a shark entering a shark cage and they had to pop the top where the divers are supposed to come out to release the shark, not the diver. So we definitely have to keep our eyes peeled, be aware at all times, watch each other's backs when we're in the cages because literally anything can happen. Just because there's bars in front of us, that's not any sign for complacency when you're in the water with an animal that formidable. The few steps between the deck and the shark cage created a bridge to the world of the Great White. My heart began to race, but this time, the nerves I felt were more distinct. This was an adrenaline rush from the excitement of a life's dream nearing closer with each and every step. My moment had finally arrived. Here we go. As I entered the cool 65 degree water, my eyes began to adjust 
and I became aware of the endless blue void that lurked below me. The sunlight danced through the 12,000 feet of water surrounding the landscape of the island, and there was no bottom in sight, meaning the sharks could be anywhere and come from any direction. Looking around, scanning for our first shark, I was in awe of the clarity of the water and the abundance of fish in the area. Our main challenge at this point was getting properly positioned. The strong currents threw us around the cages like ragdolls. So to keep the camera steady and our bodies from bouncing off the walls, we fixed our feet to the railing and held tightly with our free hands. Watching from below the surface, I could see the occasional splash from above as the crew tossed bait lines into the water. Knowing full well that each attempt could be the line to draw the apex predators from below. We waited, patiently scanning the blue abyss for any shadows or signs of movement. Minutes seemed like hours, but then, without much warning, it happened. From the distance, a dark shape began to appear. It crept toward us slowly, and then suddenly, it was right in front of us. Wow, I couldn't believe my eyes. What I've been witnessing for years on Shark Week was right in front of my lens. Finally, I was in the presence of a great white shark. It thrashed toward the bait and missed, but after a quick lap around our cage, it disappeared again. As fast as the giant flashed into view, it was gone. But this was proof of victory. We were going to be seeing sharks today, and hopefully, lots of them. On average, great white sharks will have up to 300 teeth in their mouths at any given time. And these teeth are arranged in up to seven rows with the first two known as their working teeth. As you can see by our footage, their attacks are calculated and precise. The torpedo shape of their body allows the great white to accelerate up to speeds of, get this, 35 miles an hour and strike with a force of 29 Gs. So forget about the bite for a second. The impact alone is enough to kill prey all by itself. As I calmly observe the frenzy of sharks surrounding the cage, I am reminded that I am in their world. Not only am I observing them, they are observing me. Witnessing a strange visitor in a metal cage, they would come closer and closer with each pass for a better look. And locking eyes with a great white shark is something that I'll never forget as long as I live. As my time in the cage came to a close, I couldn't help but keep my camera rolling. We had seen many impressive sharks today, but I just had this feeling that something big was about to happen. When suddenly, a giant silhouette charged from straight beneath, and with its sights locked on the prize, it lunged at full kill speed. And pow! I could not believe it. It's rare to see from the surface, let alone from underwater, but what we had just witnessed was a full breach. Behold, the full fury of the great white shark. Now feeling extremely happy with our footage, and after hours underwater, it was finally time to return to the safety of the boat. Woo! Oh my goodness, what an epic great white shark adventure that was. For our very first one, I don't think we could have asked for any more. The surface cages did not disappoint. We had all kinds of action. We had encounters right at the cage. We had fights at the bait. We had surface breaches. Huge thanks to the Socorro Vortex crew for helping us out and keeping us safe on today's adventure. Don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so you don't miss a second of the action ahead. I'm Mark Vins. Be brave. Stay wild. We'll see you on the next dive. It's no surprise that these sharks are referred to as great. They are truly a perfected product of evolution and largely differ from any of the previous sharks we've encountered on Blue Wilderness. Great whites are intelligent creatures, highly inquisitive by nature, and as we clearly witness today, master hunters of the deep. We'd like to give an extra special thank you to the captain and crew of the Socorro Vortex. To learn more about the ways you can visit Guadalupe or to support shark conservation, please visit their website at www.vortexliveaboard.com.
If you love aquatic creatures, make sure to check out the Blue Wilderness channel on YouTube so you can join me and the crew on our next dive.